Hi everyone, my name is Susanna Yandova and I'm from the group of Alexander Bova in Utrecht. Today I would like to talk a bit um, about what happens when Haddock meets Chromax. So I would like to start with a short recap of what Haddock does. I'm sure by now you are all experts at this. However, um, it never hurts to hear it once again. Um, the first stop is the rigid body energy minimization. And this is the step where you have two proteins that are very rigid, they are being separated in space, rotated and translated, and then um, being pulled together by the restraints you define, ideally um, derived from the experimental information you have. The second step, you give the interface a, bit, a little bit of push, so um, you will have a tiny bit of dynamics on the interfacial residues where they have the chance to rearrange, and so you can avoid some steric clashes. And the last step that uh, was previously a refinement in the explicit solvent, it can be still set also in the new Haddock version. However, now it's been more abolished by default by just energy minimization. And the last step, which is technically not a part of docking, but it's still quite important, is the analysis of your results. So in this step, you would rank all the models, cluster them, and then you can um, compare them, compare the energetic, um, energetic terms, and then it's much easier to look at individual clusters than 400 models one by one. All of these phases, especially the ones in the beginning here, can be um, called uh, sampling, right? Because you sample different conformations and then you can refine them a little bit. But a very important step as well is scoring. So scoring is the way how you um, basically move between those stages. That's the criterion on which you would pick the best models from each of the stage to go to the next one. And this criterion is called the Haddock score. As you can see, it is um, it slightly changes between the steps. However, um, you can also manually modify. So de depending on the scenario you are working with, you can slightly change the Haddock score. But keep in mind, you don't really change the docking procedure. You just change the, the ranking of the models that will be taken to the next phase. Right, so now when we know more what the sampling and scoring is, I would like to show you how we can incorporate MD in both of these stages. So, as I said in the beginning, you dock two rigid proteins, right? But as often in nature, proteins are not rigid either. And sometimes you, you would need a higher conformational change be before the binding. So you would need a little bit of um, yeah, rearrangement of the proteins or residues. Um, and sometimes this change is larger than what even the flexible phases of Haddock can take care of. This is the first part of my talk where I will be talking about using MD before that um, and this will be on the antibody use case. The second part I will address the scoring part and more specifically um, the case where we have um, similarly ranked clusters or different clusters but you don't know which one to pick and if MD can help us with this. So let's go to the first part. Um, this is also a bioexcel part called um, use case one, antibody design, and um, as you can guess, we work with antibodies. Um, I guess all of you know what an antibody looks like. Basically, it's this Y-shaped protein consisting of a constant region. This constant region I have written here, low immunogenicity. It means that if um, human antibody would be injected into your body, there should be a relatively low chance that your own body would um, develop antibodies against the injected antibody protein. What is however very powerful about antibodies is the very variable region. And this is um, more specifically the hypervariable loops on the very interface or a very end of the variable region. And this is the um, kind of the tool with which antibody can change the sequence or conformation of the loops and target antigens of different nature. Um, Right, so this is somehow the workflow we have in BioXO. What would Haddock do? You would have the gray antibody here and the yellow antigen here, and by default you will dock these two rigid proteins. However, as I said before, 
sometimes you need um, confirmation or rearrangement before binding. So this was the case also in this antibody here, where you see that the unbound hypervariable loops in magenta look very different to the ones in bound state, the deep blue ones. And this change didn't really work in Haddock, however, we simulated it with Chromax, and now I would like to show you some first results. Right, so these are these two workflows we were working with. This would be the default, default Haddock um, scenario, where we took two unbound structures. But what we tried is that we took now the unbound antibody crystal structure, simulated in Gromax. Um, this trajectory was then clustered based on, based on the conformation of the loops. And these clustered, uh, clusters were then uh, fed into Haddock. So we used this ensemble docking option, and then um, I would like to show you the results now. And this was done now for our complex seven antibody antigen complexes. Right, so the first results you can see here. And uh, these kind of plots show you basically the model quality versus the model ranking. So in the ideal scenario, you would like to see a correlation like this. So you would like to see um, something where the highest quality model would gain the lowest Haddock score. However, um, as you can see, it, this is not always the case. You can see that it's more um, spread, right? So you would have a lot of excess, um, um, acceptable quality models, but they are being um, ranked differently. This was the scenario without MD, and if we look at the after MD, we see that we have more models in the medium quality field. So this is quite an improvement, right? Because you don't have so many medium quality models here. However, you see that the score is still remains problematic because if you have a Haddock score of, let's say, minus 80, um, you don't really know if your model is good or bad. And uh, these are these two plots where we look at uh, these results in a bit different way. So we look at um, in which of the top X clusters um, or t top X models um, ranked by Haddock, you would have at least one medium acceptable or high quality model. And you see that in the uh, case after MD, we see a slight improvement because in also in the top 10 and 20 Haddock models, we would have more accept, more medium quality uh, models compared to the scenario without MD. However, this doesn't always work very well. So you see that in the scenario as I showed you, um, the antibody I showed you before, 3 v 6 z um, even after MD, it seems rather bad, right? You see it's rather even worse than before. Um, so what we did, we applied this accelerated weight histogram. We used the enhanced sampling analysis, and this is the case where the antibody would be pulled pulled apart from the antigen, and then um, would sample the interface loops, right? So you would have maybe even better sampling. Um, this was the workflow we used, and you see that the results are significantly improved. So now we are more in the medium quality field. And this was rather encouraging. Um, so with this, I would like to conclude the first part of my talk, where um, we see that MD before docking does improve the sampling. We see that we have more, well, more of better models. However, we get also a higher number of worse models. Um, and we still might have some trouble with scoring them right. However, if we uh, use the enhanced sampling method, we get also better results for the very problematic um, amino acids. And here you can see a short movie made by Alessandra Villa and KTH where you see the accelerated weight histogram simulations of this antibody, as I showed you before, and you see how the antigen is being pulled by, pulled away by the reaction coordinate in red. Right, so let's come to the second part of my talk, which is called um, native or non-native, so we want to identify which cluster is native. Um, what does it mean? As you can see here, we have the reference in the middle. So this is the crystal structure you would wish to have, or that's the correct one. And then you see, um, if you would look automatically at the best ranked cluster by a Haddock score, it looks nothing like the reference, right? It's very different. And this could first be not very um, good news. However, if you dig 
further through the through the hot dog result, you see that okay, there are actually there is actually the right solution, but it may be somewhere a bit further. It may be the second or third rank cluster, which you would not automatically look at. And our question was okay, can MD help us with this problem? Um, so what we did, we simulated twenty five complexes. Uh, which were docked by Haddock, right? So the, the first part was just the standard Haddock procedure, and then uh, um, complexes were divided into uh, models of high quality and models of low quality. And the high quality models were called the native ones, and then the low quality are the non native ones, but they are still relatively highly ranked clusters. And then we also simulated the reference. Um, structures just for um, comparison and we analyzed these simulations. We analyzed them and looked at a number of properties. We looked at the initial, the crucial Capri properties like ligand RMSD, interface RMSD, fraction of native or original contacts, bird surface area, distance between the proteins, non-bonded energies as well as number of hydrogen bonds. And then from these Analysis, we fed these properties into a machine learning classifier. Well, the first question we had, okay, we may, we wanted to know if the non-native models can improve over time. Like, right, maybe they are not good after docking, but if we simulate them for 100 nanoseconds, they would come closer to the reference. So in this step, we would compare the, the course of the simulation to the original crystal structure. So the reference that you would wish to achieve. And this is what we got. Um, in these graphs, you can see trajectory stretches. So 0 to 5, 5 to 10 nanoseconds, etc. And this box plot of all 20 complexes. So these are 20 complexes and all put together. And then we see the interface RMSD and ligand RMSD. And we see in green uh, the, the reference simulations which remain the lowest or the most similar to the original complex, complex crystal structure, which also makes sense, right? Because they are basically coming from the crystal structure, so they don't deviate too much. Um, the acceptable are close enough, don't deviate too much over time. However, the non-native ones, they were already from the beginning high up and they don't seem to come closer. So for both native and non-native ones, we don't see any significant improvement over time or um, coming closer to the crystal structure, which could also be expected in only 100 nanoseconds. Um, this is another, another plot where I'm showing you the fraction of original contacts. So you can see that um, even the reference um, simulations lose a lot of original contacts that they would have with the um, in the original crystal structure, so up to maybe in average 70%, right? They would lose um, up to 70% of the original contacts because of the uh, minimization, equilibration, and also um, these intermolecular contacts are defined as rather strict. So it's only five angstroms, and then that can be violated rather easily. The next question, we considered a more realistic scenario. So a scenario where you don't have the reference structure, because usually when you want to dock something, you don't know what the result should be. And then um, we compared all of these properties to the start of the trajectory. And here you can see them. So obviously they are the lowest in the beginning because that's where it starts, it's the um, start of the trajectory. And these properties are um, slowly increasing. However, what you can see already that the incurrent complexes, here it seems the RMSD for all 20 complexes in average is going much higher than for the reference and native complexes. And the same trend you see also with the fraction of native contacts. So even though you start all of this, you compare to the point zero here, you see that by the end of the 100 nanoseconds, these non-native complexes lose up to almost 100% of the original intermolecular contacts. So they are really much more unstable than the native ones, which is quite interesting. And this change we didn't really expect. So we thought, okay, 
let's took these properties and put them into a machine learning classifier. So how we did is we divided the trajectory into short snippets or stretches. And then uh, we had all the properties I was talking to you before. Um, they were regarded as features and they were labeled as native or non-native according to the complex they came from. And this was then fed into a random forest classifier, which was before optimized and now was trained. So this random forest classifier consists of many decision trees. However, um, there is there are more levels of randomness. You can read about it or I can tell you later. And now we train the model and let's look if it worked. And so first we tried the model on the initial training set. So we had a training set of 20 complexes and then try to um, see how well it can work on predicting um, another set within the training set. So we did this cross-validation um, 100 times where we would always divide the training set into one subset which it was trained on and one set that we would predict the accuracy for. And this was in average 0 0.86, which is quite nice. Also the uh, rock curve looks rather promising. So we were quite happy about this. But one could still say it's not very fair, or the comparison is not very fair, since um, we don't have any other complexes. So what we did, we looked at um, two independent sets of always five complexes, um, where um, the training set never seen these, right? So you would have, the, the model was trained of the training set that was independent to those two test sets. And then you see that we have the accuracy of 0 0.6 or 0 0.75, which is really nice. And um, why is it so different? So we look also at the individual um, properties of both test set, as I showed you before. And we see in this test set with a lower accuracy, we might, um, the properties are not really very different. So there, the native and non-native complexes don't really behave too differently. However, we can still distinguish between them with the accuracy of 0 0.6, which is still quite nice. Um, the random forest classifier can also tell you which features are the most important ones, which is really nice. So we see that all features are similarly important. However, the interface are misty, change in the native context and change in the bird surface area are the most important features. And this is quite logical if you think about it, if a binding of two um, proteins is not very stable, of course the bird surface area will um, decrease more than for the stable complex. And with this I would like to conclude the second part of my talk. Um, well, MD does not improve the quality of the low complexes, however, um, it can show you nicely what the differences are in behavior between native and non-native ones. And so we were able to uh, build a machine learning classifier on top of this and we get a quite nice um, result also for the external validation set. And these little movies, they're just an example of uh, behavior between those two models. So we had a native one and non-native one and here you can see how it really unbinds already after maybe 30 nanoseconds. And you see how it goes through its periodic copy and finds the partner on the other side of the box. So with this, I would like to thank you a lot for your attention. Thanks all my uh, BioXL partners, mostly KTH in uh, Stockholm. And then thank my computational uh, structure biology lab. Thank you.